Yes, I think that will have put us live. Yes, we are audio live, guys, so you're on stream. Hello, stream. Hello. Hello. Hello, stream. Welcome to live. Hello, <laughs> stream. Welcome to live. Yeah. Welcome. This is pre stream. We'll start in, uh, let's say, five minutes while we grab a drink. We were having some uh, audio connectivity issues, uh, which I think are all fixed now, unless you are hearing me as a horrible echoey monster, which I don't think you are. Yeah. Welcome. This is. Yeah, seems to be. Clean. Oh, boy. Uh, that don't sounds forget, like a... we have uh, patrons and crew with us on the voice channel, of course. And uh, there is a Q&A channel open. I'm going to see if I can get the Russia Rework developers out of their hiding. And go over my Discord messages right before we start. Hussar, are you going live the same time that Vincent is? Uh, I'm just drawing better. <laughs> if, if I need Sorry, to go... Sorry, is taking over this uh, this live stream. Uh... Yep. <laughs> I'm gonna watch okay, it. Okay, no, no, no. no, no, okay. I, I thought it was a YouTube live stream. Okay, no, but, uh, yeah, we're not. Offline. We're uh, we're we're showing the. Uh... But you can you can you can stream here. Uh, I will nope, share nope, my nope. screen to you guys, so you can see what's happening on mine. I'm not sure if it's gonna break the stream. Maybe. Oh so, boy. This is just my main monitor but i will it's probably better to watch the stream if you're uh like switching to youtube but normally the way i've set up obs now i'll, I'll be able to keep talking in the channel i don't have to use my main monitor to play it to play the audio it will just stream the audio and video to youtube yes high technology i think uh chat is like 60 percent russians today leave yet anyone, chat anyone fluent cyrillic reader <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where's all it. where's all the russia devs they were oh, here before love it love it yeah uh marcus can you uh tag the day go and get the guys off here so we can answer some questions now <clears throat> we'll be playing the thing first first i'll um let's put on my camera if i can find the correct here we go yes yes good evening good afternoon good friday everyone this is the release of Kaiser Reich Documentary Episode 4, fully centered on the Russia. We have, I think, not a single Russian speaker in our crew chat right now? Nope. Okay, so use uh, English in chat if possible. We won't be able to answer questions in Russian. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dago is coming on. Dago is coming on. Right? He, may, he, may, he may help us. Uh, so this documentary is 40 minutes long, so you better grab a drink. Uh, we're going to be here for a while. Going to make it nice and cozy. Uh, I will also do a prize question, and the prize question is, uh, winner will get a hoodie. Um, let's make it an easy one. I think we had a lot of problems last time, Marcus, with uh, people just not finding the answer. So the first person to answer me the, uh, email me the answer to the following. So the email is my Kazakat Cinema email. Uh, what country does Boldereth flee to after his putsch fails? First person to email me that answer to the Kazakat Cinema email gets a free hoodie. All right. That is it. Um, anything you guys want to add before we go? Just play this thing. Um, we should want to thank the Russia devs for their hard work. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. We should probably we should probably thank the entire crew. So um, Marcus Jorgensen for editing. Uh, great work, Marcus. He spent an uh, ungodly amount of time uh, sourcing through very difficult to find footage, especially as we get into Russia, Manchuria, Chinese Asia things. In the 1920s, very hard to find footage. I think you could speak to that, Marcus. Uh, it's really hard to find footage about in East Asia during the early 30s. Yes, there you go. So that's uh, that's a problem we'll have to deal with as we go forward. Uh, Gabriel Matsakis for writing, as well as the Russia Rework team who helped us during the entire process, uh, basically getting this video up to snuff. We'll talk more about the writing and this episode in uh, in particular after watching it. I think it's um, it's an interesting one because uh, it's been quite heavily edited from its first draft where. Um, we started with a very heavy emphasis on the Russian Civil War, but then uh, speaking to Gabriel, speaking to the Russia Rework team, they felt the focus had to actually shift away from the Russian Civil War. And we now have a very large section about Russian politics after the Civil War. So basically that 1920s Kaiserreich lore that the documentaries are now going to talk about in, in detail um, is something that we don't generally see in media or talked about in Kaiserreich. It's mentioned in events. So that is something that we'll be doing for Kaiserreich documentary going forward diving deep into the 1920s, very formative years for the Kaiserreich world. So it starts with this uh, documentary and then 
Next episode, episode 5, will be about central power. So we'll be going into internal politics of the German Empire. Uh, we'll be going into Eastern Europe. We'll be going into things like uh, Austria-Hungary, Ottoman Empire. We're still not sure how long each episode is going to take. So th those numbers may change. But the end idea is to have like somewhere between 8 and 12 episodes covering the entirety of 1919 up to 1936 lore in Kaiserreich. Uh, and then we'll bundle them all into one big video. It'll be really cool, like an eight-hour lore dump, just to send your friends to mess with them. Um, and of course, the script for the documentary also doubles as the uh, script for the art book, right? All the art we're making, all the things we're doing now for documentary, they double for the art book and they help us basically fill it out. So we now have, I think, you know how, how many pages of script uh, episode four has, Marcus? You have an idea? Uh... Uh, oh god it was like it was wasn't wasn't it about four thousand words or so we we, we said uh, it's 15 i know it's between 15 and 30 but that's like <laughs> very let me let me pull it up just give me a minute episode four scripts it is 18 pages so if you like do that times eight we're looking at 160 pages of pure text for the art book itself so we'll definitely be we'll need some edit anyhow uh let's not drag this out any longer i think by the way that um gabriel is having issues uh speaking oh i'm, I'm here now i oh, wasn't okay, able to join okay, earlier here. okay cool um, there, so this channel, the Guys Get Cinema channel, I've set, I put the setting so that it's a public channel, but everyone who doesn't have like true or patron role is going to come in auto muted, has to be unmuted by moderator. So they have to request to be unmuted. This, uh, I wanted to use the discord public stage channel, but I'm really not sure what the advantage there is because there's no screen share on that. It's really weird. Anyhow, um, I suggest we just go into the video. So let's hope that I click the right thing on OBS and I don't send you guys scrolling all the way through the void i think the button is here okay i'm gonna try this and then i am going to mute myself uh let me know in chat if anything goes wrong but you should be seeing the full documentary 40 minutes and we'll see you right after all right see you guys <laughs> We are proud to announce our new video sponsor, Supremacy1914. The kind people over at Bytro Labs saw that we were raising funds for our alt history videos and stepped in to help with their own alt history game. Grand Strategy fans will feel right at home in Supremacy1914, which allows you to control any nation during a Great War setting. The twist is, the game is fully online and hosts up to 500 players simultaneously. It's a great grand strategy game that can be played on both mobile and browser. With a 4.4 rating on Google App Store, I can warmly recommend Supremacy 1914. You can join using the affiliate link in the description to get 15,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. This offer is only valid for 30 days, so make sure to decide fast. And now, enjoy the show, cats. It was once said that Russia is an enigma wrapped in a mystery, wrapped in a riddle. Such a phrase speaks eloquently to the Western sense of Petrograd as the other, an inscrutable and menacing land that plays by its own rules. A hard land, with hard climate and hard people. It would seem only fitting that a nation like Russia would suffer such tragedies in the 20th century, and yet continue to rise from them. Every time the Russian bear would return again, every time stronger, more menacing, more united. For the Kaiser in Europe knows his true enemy lies east, as it always has. There will be another war over Eastern Europe, that much is certain. But if Germany is unlucky, she may have to fight two revanchist powers at once. Caught between the rise of Western syndicalism and a resurgent Russia, a trap is closing on the Kaiser. Germany may soon face a new Russia. A Russia united under one people, one nation, one Vojd.
The turn of the 20th century would be marked by a series of military defeats and economic turmoil that would shake the foundations of the Russian Empire and her Romanov rulers. Japan's humiliation of the ostensibly much stronger Russia in the 1904 Russo-Japanese War caught the attention of many Russians, who saw this defeat as a metaphor for the failures of the Romanov dynasty. In 1905, a first popular revolt raged through the massive Russian Empire. This liberal revolution would ultimately be silenced, but not without minor reforms. More importantly, it would plant in the hearts of the Russian people a seed of disobedience and resistance against the ruling status quo. The population of Russia had long suffered under the yoke of serfdom and inept rule by an out-of-touch aristocratic class. As the years progressed, however, things went from bad to worse. Russia lurched into the 20th century, failing to modernize both politically and economically, staying behind other European powers in industrialization. In the vaunted halls of London, Berlin and Paris, it was whispered that Russia was a house of glass, magnificent, but a single crack could send her tumbling down. Words that would forebode the dark future awaiting the vast empire. When Tsar Nicholas unilaterally declared war on Germany in defense of Serbia in 1914, he unknowingly sparked a worldwide calamity that would later be known as the Great War. At the start of his Weltkrieg, the Kaiser made it a priority to crush France before turning his army east. While Russian fighting spirit was unmatched, the Russian army would soon find themselves to be outmatched by the technologically superior German army. The wars of the 20th century would be decided by the range of artillery and communication lines, a difficult task for the vast and sparsely industrialized areas of the Russian front. Still, the outmatched Russians fought tenaciously as they were driven out of Poland and Galicia. Many of these stories would ascend to become legendary tales of heroism, such as the March of the Dead Men. Despite such propaganda victories, the war would push Russia's straining resources and military to the breaking point. As famines ravaged the hinterland, soldiers began deserting en masse. They would turn their attention in the opposite direction, taking their weapons to the Russian capital of Petrograd in a bid to secure better living conditions for the Russian people. The situation rapidly became untenable. It would not be long until soldiers and striking workers seized control of the capital and demanded the formation of a more democratic government. This uprising led to the February Revolution of 1917, a series of strikes that saw the Tsar cede considerable power to a democratically elected parliament, or as Russians refer to it, the Duma. Chosen to lead this new democratic government was the notorious Alexander Kerensky, Kerensky was a lawyer and revolutionary who joined the provisional government by using the Socialist Revolutionary Party as a vessel. A pro-democracy proponent and free press advocate, Kerensky had the ambition of using the crisis to transform Russia into a modern democracy. However, the Germans saw this political instability as an opportunity to knock Russia out of the war entirely. With the support of German secret agents, the revolutionary Lenin was sent back into the country Lenin's Marxist ideology began spreading like wildfire, and Kerensky soon found his own democratic institutions turning against him in a wave of popular revolt. Russia's population in 1917 was tired, hungry, and demoralized from year after year of non-stop defeat. Many began blaming Kerensky and the inept and corrupt military leadership for Russia's failures against Germany. Lenin's Marxist ideology found fertile ground among the discontented workers and soldiers of Russia. Soon they began organizing. They formed revolutionary councils, so-called Soviets, to pressure the Kerensky government into far-reaching concessions and land reform. These communist revolutionaries would become known as the Bolsheviks. As Lenin's Bolsheviks took control of more and more of the Kerensky government, they clamored for peace and bread. This defeatism was condemned by the Russian military elites, who hatched plans to remove the Bolsheviks from power by force. These rising tensions between government and military would lead to a fateful incident called the Kornilov Affair. 
By 1917, Russia's Old Guard military leadership was blamed for the country's continuous failures against the German Empire. Kerensky, pressured by rising Bolshevik sentiment, began replacing much of the chain of command. This gave initiative to lower-ranking generals and officers, such as one Lava Kornilov. Kornilov, born to a family of Siberian Cossacks in present-day Turkestan, had known a decorated military career. Kornilov served in the Russo-Japanese War and later as military attaché in China. A staunch nationalist and military traditionalist, Kornilov would later go on to clash with the democratic Kerensky and Kolchak and support the rising nationalist parties of Russia. Notorious for his hatred of the left and the Bolsheviks, Kornilov believed that Lenin's Petrograd Soviets formed a serious threat to Russia's capacity to fight the war. He hoped to remove the Soviets in one fell swoop and began hatching a plan. In late 1917, General Kornilov sent a detachment of cavalry to pacify and secure the city of Petrograd, a Soviet stronghold. When Kerensky and his government caught wind of the coup, he was furious. The government considered Kornilov's actions a rogue initiative and promptly dismissed the general. In an unfortunate turn of events, Kerensky warned the Petrograd Soviets that Kornilov was approaching, prompting them to arm themselves and stop the oncoming attack. The Soviets did so successfully and Kornilov was arrested. However, after the military coup was foiled, Bolshevik soldiers refused orders by the government to stand down. Instead, sensing weakness, the communists launched a coup of their own. This revolution would be later called the October Revolution and marked the start of the Russian Civil War. As the Bolsheviks rallied large parts of the Russian army, the Russians turned their weapons on each other. Two large factions emerged at the start of the Civil War, the Communist Bolsheviks and the pro-government White Forces that later united under Admiral Kolchak. Alexander Vasilyevich Kolchak was a popular and well-decorated Imperial Russian Admiral. Having fought in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and the Great War, he became recognized as the supreme leader and commander of all White Forces by 1918. Loyal to the Romanov dynasty, but also a pro-democratic Republican, Kolchak was a popular figure with both the nobles, general population, and the military. With Russia in crisis, white forces saw no better man to lead the war, even as the situation deteriorated rapidly. Red forces quickly took control of the Russian industrial heartland, pushing the whites out to the fringes and Russian hinterland. More worryingly, red forces intercepted the Tsar as he attempted to flee and imprisoned the royal family at Yekaterinburg. By the time Kolchak's white forces arrived there, they found only bodies. The execution of Tsar Nicholas and his family cratered white morale, but also rallied anti-Bolshevik sentiment in the white-controlled areas. Many moderates rose to condemn the brutal killing of the imperial family and painted Lenin as a tyrant and murderer. Ironically, not long thereafter, the Bolshevik leader would face a similar fate. In the summer of 1918, Lenin toured an arms factory in Moscow. When he approached the crowd to shake hands, a smiling woman reached out to him, drew a revolver, and shot Lenin through the chest. The Soviet leader dropped to the ground, dead upon impact. The assassin attempted to flee the scene, but was captured. She was later revealed to be Fanny Kaplan, a prominent anarchist in the Bolshevik coalition. The death of Lenin sent shockwaves through the Red Army. Rumors began spreading that Kaplan was working for another faction of the Red Front and that the assassination was a plot to stop Lenin's growing influence. Kaplan was shot without trial four days later. Her legacy would be great, however. Lenin's death would be a seminal downturn in the political unity of the Soviets and the Red Army. Now that the playing field had been leveled, White forces rallied around several key individuals leading troops against the Bolshevik menace. Kolchak and Kornilov settled their grievances after the death of the Tsar and focused on the larger task of defeating the Red Army. The staunch Republican and his nationalist rival were soon joined by two other prominent figures from their respective parties, the Democratic Viktor Chernov and authoritarian Boris Savinkov. Viktor Chernov was a political leader from the Democratic SR party that was dominant in the Duma during the Civil War. Together with Kolchak, he advocated for a new Russian Republic to emerge from the ruins of the Civil War. 
Savinkov, on the other hand, was a fanatic militarist suspected of several high-ranking assassinations and even terrorism. He was supported by Kornilov as being an effective statesman and grew popular with the soldiers and officers throughout the war. These four men would continue to clash over their differing visions for Russia, even throughout the Civil War. They found common ground on one thing, however. Before all else, the Bolsheviks had to be destroyed. Sensing weakness in the Red Front, the Western armies took Vitebsk and Petrograd and began contesting Smolensk. With shortages of food and equipment, the Reds were forced to retreat. This respite lasted for several months, allowing white forces to recapture key territories. The 1919 Spring Offensive, later made legendary as the Run to the Volga, saw Kornilov uniting his forces with the rest of the army rather than attempting his own offensive on Moscow. The Red counter-offensive against the Whites failed, and many point to this event as the moment in the Civil War where the balance tipped decidedly in favor of White forces. Political instability was not limited to the Red camp, however. As white leaders met for the second time at Ufa that year, a fierce political battle erupted over the need for military leadership. To keep the White Front united, Kolchak was forced to follow along with the cadets and SRs and cede considerable power to the nationalist Kornilov. The German Kaiser, fearing the communist uprising in the East, struck a secret deal with his military leadership through Ukrainian proxies. Through these backroom channels, Kornilov was promised German aid against the Red Menace. While officially Russia and Germany would remain in a state of war, commanders on both sides were ordered to minimize and avoid open conflict. With the quiet backing of German forces, Red troops were forced to retreat further. The Red Army was wounded by shortages of food, munitions, and widespread desertions. The Whites saw their chance as the forward defenses of Moscow, capital city of the Russian Soviets, dissolved. By the middle of 1920, Moscow was assaulted on all sides by White forces. After fierce fighting, the city fell on August 31, 1920. What remained of the Red Army began a retreat to Arkhangelsk, where they were chased relentlessly. Those few foreign Bolsheviks who managed to escape the country retreated to friendly syndicalist nations such as France and later the Union of Britain. The Russian Revolution failed partly due to the gullible nature of the Soviet leadership. After Lenin's assassination, Bukharin, Stalin, and Trotsky squabbled over control. And I should have known then we were doomed. At best, Trotsky was a gullible fool. And at worst, a soft-hearted idiot. The deaths of millions of Soviet citizens can be blamed on his inability to see the internal threats tearing the United Soviets apart. Even as the Whites pressed us out of Ekaterinburg and our Western Front collapsed, we were occupied mostly with political sideline arguments. The anarchist wing of the party infected the Soviets like a cancer planting in the men imbecilic and unsustainable ideas of a future in Russia without a government. Kolchak and Kornilov learned from our internal division and assembled a strong dictatorship to bring the whites through the war. I despise them for everything they stand for. But in this, they were not wrong. When Moscow fell, we fled Russia as common criminals, hiding on freighters to Britain. While the revolution failed in Russia, the international brigades would survive and reorganize in the United Kingdom. After we helped the syndicalists topple the monarchy, the British Red Terror that followed was swift and effective. All voices of opposition within the party were silenced and total control was established. The difference between the Bolsheviks and the British Republicans was that the British were prepared to cut once and cut deep. 
I still hold that on the British Isles. Thousands of lives were saved by sacrificing a few hundred. When we returned to Chicago, we vowed to remember the lessons we learned in Europe. When we began allying the various syndicates in the Greater Lakes area, we ensured no man would step out of line. Only a strong leadership figure could assure the success of the American Revolution. The combined syndicates would not fail where the Soviets had. We called this ideology one of total state control. Everything within the state. Nothing outside the state. Nothing against the state. Total control. The name stuck. Later on, the party would call us the Totalist. On the 28th of January, 1921, white forces declared victory in Russia. To the surprise of many, Kornilov and the military did indeed relinquish their wartime powers by declaring that Petrograd would hold a great constitutional assembly. The victorious provisional government was reassembled under Alexander Guchkov, who became Russia's first president. But while one war had ended, another still loomed. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed between Germany and the Bolsheviks, not the white government. This meant, technically, Russia and Germany were still at war. White Russia's preoccupation with her civil war had seen German interests directed westward for most of the latter half of the war, first to break the Entente outside Paris, and then to guard against the unprecedented French syndicalist revolution. The radical militarist and nationalist factions, spearheaded by Savinkov, believed this was the perfect opportunity to continue the war against a distracted and exhausted Germany. Their hastily prepared and highly unrealistic plan involved a rapid campaign to recapture Russia's breakaway provinces. To the democratic government, however, the continuation of the largest war in human history, on the heels of a civil war no less, was nothing short of madness. Order had not yet been restored across Russia's vast territories, Famine was widespread, and the country was on the verge of economic collapse. This provisional government approved the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, originally negotiated by the fallen Bolshevik government on the 13th of October 1921. While this was a sound move to any reasonable observer, in nationalist circles the treaty was seen as an incredible humiliation. By signing the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the democratic government accepted the very defeatism of the Bolsheviks they defeated just months earlier. It was in these turbulent times that Savinkov began his political rise. The nationalist had emerged in the Duma as a popular, fiery orator, promising everything to everyone. Further land reform to the peasants, reconquest to the revanchists, and strong leadership to those convinced of Russia's failings. In 1924, he broke with his former party, the right-wing SRs, and formed his own SZRS party. This motherland party incorporated both social revolutionaries and cadets who struggled to find a political home. Savinkov's new Party of the People quickly attracted burgeoning support from the peasantry, student intelligentsia, and nationalist groups. To the Russian populace, Savinkov seemed like a bold leader for a difficult era. Many began to refer to him as the leader, or as it is called in Russian, the Vojd. By 1925, Russia's troubles had only worsened, as inflation truly spiraled beyond control. Economic ties to the United States, once a source of strength, quickly became a liability, as the Wall Street crash sent the American economy stumbling. Soon, the Russian government found itself forced to turn to the hated Germans for aid, a situation epitomized by the 1926 Vilnius Agreement. The agreement provided a framework for broad German investment across Russia, which would pave the way for industrialization yet unseen in the country. To opponents like Savinkov, however, this was yet another defeat, a desperate measure taken at the cost of Russian sovereignty. Not only had the democratic government signed the humiliating peace of Brest-Litovsk, they were now also subjecting themselves to the very German influence that cost them control over Eastern Europe. The more Russia struggled, 
the stronger Sevinkov grew. The 1927 elections would bring more seats for his party, soon followed by a sweeping propaganda victory. Worried by the election's results, the SRs and cadets had introduced legislation to stifle and politically disarm the Motherland Party. The move had exactly the opposite effect. Now armed with legitimate complaints of unjust censorship and repression, Savinkov unleashed a barrage of accusations against the government. Soon the legislation failed, and Savinkov emerged stronger than ever. Still, he and his Motherland Party remained on the political fringe. It would take something greater yet to propel him from the backseat of the Duma into the halls of the Kremlin. Fortunately for Savinkov, despite all Russia's troubles, worse was yet to come. This time it would be a humiliation all too familiar, and on all too familiar a field, the rolling hills of Manchuria. The Chinese Eastern Railway, or CER, running from the city of Chita in the Russian Far East to the city of Harbin in the heart of Manchuria, had been a matter of dispute since the early days of the Civil War nearly a decade before. In early 1927, a minor incident at the border city of Manjuli quickly escalated. Neither Russia nor Jiang Zhuolin's Chinese authorities were entirely clear on how to respond. The Russian Far Eastern district under General Konstantin Sakharov was only partially mobilized, and Jiang's forces were fiercely engaged with the Ji Li clique to the south. As negotiations dragged on and eventually proved futile, the SR cadet government recognized an opportunity, not just to strengthen their position over the railway, but also to beat Savinkov at his own game. With the government's blessing, General Sakharov hastily amassed 200,000 troops, 50,000 of whom were soon marching across the border at Manjuli. The Chinese fought a fighting retreat, but soon the Russians had secured all of Hela and settled in as an occupying force north of the greater Kingan range. Still fighting a war to the south, the situation would only worsen for Jiang with the end of summer as a Russian flotilla crushed a Chinese riverine armada on the Amur and detachments of Cossacks began to raid into the countryside. The Japanese, with their own agenda, thus far refused to intervene. After two victories and no responses from the Japanese, Russian forces grew bolder. Sakharov was convinced that the war could be pursued past mere border skirmishes. The arrival of winter gave him a chance to redeploy both himself and some of his best forces into the Primoye. Following the early thaw of 1928, Sakharov swept aside the Chinese forces left to guard the frontier and began his march westward, largely following the Trans-Siberian Railroad, toward his first objective on the road to Harbin, the cities of Mundanjeng and Ningang. However, not all was well in Sakharov's camp. An unexpected snow squall in mid-March drastically slowed the advance and grounded his reconnaissance aircraft. The narrow front of advance had likewise turned much of his army into a snaking column, navigating the valleys through which the railway had been built. Worse yet, the unreliability of the dizzying array of radios the Russians were using meant communications, poor and largely unencrypted to begin with, had broken down within a week of the offensive, forcing Sakharov to rely on messengers. Finally reaching Mundangjang almost a week behind schedule, Sakharov's forces began making quick progress. Momentum was soon lost, however, as the defending Chinese forces proved stronger than expected. Sakharov's incredulity would soon turn to horror as frantic messengers began arriving from his rearguard. Though no two reports agreed with each other, what was clear was that a catastrophe was brewing. Simultaneously, and at several different points along the column, Sakharov's army had come under attack by an unknown ambusher with surprisingly modern equipment. When Russian forces saw the ambushers bear down upon their rear, their flag came into view. With shock and horror, Sakharov realized he was facing an old enemy. Flying over the ambushed army were the colors of the rising sun. The Empire of Japan had finally responded. The Japanese Kwantung army had observed Sakharov's buildup of forces in the Primoye with great interest. When both scouts and intercepted radio transmissions proved his intentions without a doubt, the Japanese launched into action. Aware of the Russians' avenue of advance, Japanese infantry had made a difficult trek into the highlands south of the Trans-Siberian Railroad, ready to strike as soon as Sakharov's troops stalled at Mundanjang. Others, wearing Chinese uniforms, 
had taken up positions in the city itself. The results were immediate and decisive. Overstretched and taken completely by surprise, Sakharov's rear guard was routed. Despite attempts to turn his forces around and punch through the encirclement, the breakdown of supplies, command, and morale left only a foregone conclusion. After a week of further futility, Sakharov bitterly resigned himself to surrender. Nearly 30,000 soldiers of his special Pramoye Corps were captured, wounded, or killed in the field. The defeat was a political disaster for the SR cadet government. For all the damage years of symbolic defeats had done, and for all they had hoped to gain from a quick and easy victory, an actual defeat in the field was something else entirely. Unsurprisingly, Savinkov was quick to capitalize on the debacle. Russia had yet again been humiliated, and the government could not have been more unpopular. Seeing the writing on the wall, Democratic-leaning General Vasily Boldarev attempted a preventative putsch in 1929, hoping for support from the SRs and cadets, hoping to use a combination of military might and political power to decisively crush the Motherland Party once and for all. The necessary support never came. Instead, the Russian government began what would later become known as the Christmas Purge, a sweeping series of forced retirements and prosecutions, targeting allies of both Boldarev and Savinkov. Boldarev fled the country, and once again Savinkov railed against the government, letting fly accusations of tyranny and repression. According to Savinkov, only a weak government would fear those who had served and bled in its name. Only a weak government would resort to such violent, extreme measures. Boldirev, the traitor, they call me now. Boldirev the exiled. Boldirev, who sits in Georgia wringing his hands, plotting the downfall of Great Russia. You fools. My loyalists and I are the only ones up to the task of protecting Russia. Look around you, brothers. Do the silver skulls and black uniforms not remind you of the oppression of the Okrana, the Romanov dynasty, the mass hysteria of the Bolshevik revolution? Does it matter whether the flags they wave are black or red? They are snakes choking the foundations of the Russian Republic either way. They say I have no popular support. They say I am an arrogant figment of Russia's past. I do not have the people's support because I am not a lying snake like Savinkov, dripping on eight words into their ears with a knife behind his back. Out here in Georgia, we dodge his assassins on a weekly basis. I am pushed to the frings, made politically mute and hunted, but I survive. The dream of a Russian democracy survives with me. Savinkov controls the radio. Savinkov controls the newspapers. Savinkov controls the army. Slowly his black tendrils wrap around the last vestiges of democracy and freedom in Russia, and you are all too blind to see it. Like bleating sheep, his motherland party will lead you all to slaughter. I organized the putsch as a last-ditch attempt to remove Savinkov his influence from the apparatus of state but I fear it may already be too late. Savinkov has once again succeeded in painting his opponents as enemies, and once more the Russian populace wades deeper into his lies. There is a specter hunting Russia. It is the specter of national populism. And me and Viktor Chernov are the last men able to stop it. In the end, despite all the allies he had lost in the purge, Savinkov gained politically. Bolstered by the backlash against the government and the disastrous defeat in Manchuria, the Motherland Party would go on to perform exceptionally well in the 1930 elections, well enough to compete directly with the other parties. Two years later, in 1932, 
The violent repression of the Tambov Peasant Revolt would prove yet another arrow in Savinkov's political quiver. Economic mismanagement had driven the people to take what he called desperate measures, and they had been met in return by violence. Increasingly, the press ran with Savinkov's words. This time, the government were called butchers. By 1934, as Russia's countless peasants continued to struggle, and the government found itself buried under scandal after scandal, the political winds had begun to shift. One by one, politicians began to defect to Savinkov's side, as much out of self-preservation as genuine political belief. Soon, where other right-wing parties had once been careful to avoid association with the Motherland Party, they began to court Savinkov's attention openly. Then, in the Duma elections of that year, the decisive moment came. The Motherland Party gained more seats than any other, which soon became an absolute majority, thanks to a newly announced coalition with the Conservative Assembly of Russian Unification. Savinkov, once nothing more than a dissident and a terrorist, was sworn in as President of the Republic on October 4, 1934. As Savinkov entered the Kremlin, his opposition withered and weakened. Kolchak and Kerensky, leaders of the Democratic Front, had left the political scene some time earlier. Kerensky disappeared almost wordlessly. Blamed for the failings of the Democratic Front in the 1920s, the former head of government had finally had enough. The last known recording of Kerensky was from him boarding a ship towards the Americas, noting to the present journalist that he had suffered enough for Russia. Kolchak, for his part, had become Minister of the Navy and grew resentful of the bickering of the Petrograd political scene. Savinkov, ever the savvy political operator, ensured Kolchak would harbour no ideas of returning to prominence by vastly increasing his naval budgets. Kolchak now saw almost bottomless funding for the Admiral's life passion, the pursuit of Arctic exploration. With Kolchak sailing off across the North Pole, another pawn was moved off Savinkov's board. In the following months and years, Savinkov gradually amassed and centralized his power, both within the government and without it. In the Duma, he had already begun to sideline his coalition allies, and soon only one real opponent remained, Viktor Chernov democracy's last defender, who had since rallied an alliance of minor opposition parties and other interests against Savinkov's growing power. Still, the president's supporters spread violence in the streets and beyond. Already, those critical of Savinkov and his growing power had, more often than not, begun to slowly and silently disappear, and whispers swirled that he was assembling an ideological police force, one to match or even exceed the old Tsarist Okhrana. The democratic ideals of the Russian Republic were wasting away at their very foundation. Soon, Chernov would become the only man standing in the way of Savinkov's total domination over the Russian state. Balancing between totalitarianism and democracy, Russia was a country on the brink. It would take only a single spark to light the powder keg. To be continued. Kaiser Cat Cinema needs you. Back the attack. Share our content or dash over to our alt history webshop. The Kaiserreich documentary is back. We hope you enjoyed the fourth episode of the deepest of Kaiserreich lore dives. The crew at Kaiser Cat Cinema is on a mission to unearth the deep and varied lore of this rich alt history world we all love. A Kaiserreich book in every store, a Kaiserreich show on every screen. This is the great project that we and everyone else at Kaiser Cat Cinema are working towards. And at the end of every video, we ask for your support in this great endeavor. Our next episodes will focus on the German Empire and the Central Powers after their victory in the Great War. Don't forget, we are also working on an upcoming animatic series set in the world of Kaiserreich, called The Divided States. Our first episode is slated for release on Christmas 2021. Check it out at dividedstates-project.com. Kazakat Cinema is a fully crowdfunded operation whose content will be free to watch forever. This is only possible because of the hard work and contributions of our patron and crew. I would like to specifically thank our top patron backers, James Carroll, Ranmax, and Kicker. They are joined by our gentle cats, Mr. Knowledge, GTG, Alex, Kingfish, Deproysen, Bill Gates, 
Lincoln Neal, James C, Sibel, Luna, Evan, Alexander, and 150 other patrons. Patrons can make cameo appearances in our shows and animations, as you can see on the screen below me. For this episode, I would also like to thank our director Marcus Jurgensen, our writer Gabriel Matsakis, our cartographer Rusky Business, and the entire Kaiserreich Russia Rework team for helping us out with law research and localization. We hope you enjoyed watching this documentary half as much as we enjoyed making it, because we had a blast. And don't forget our video sponsor, Supremacy1914. You can click the link in the description to check out the game, and if you sign up using our affiliate link in the description, you will get 15,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. This offer is only valid for 30 days, so make sure you decide fast. Thanks for everything, and I will see you for the next one, cats. Vincent out. All my stuff, testing, testing. Can you guys say something? I think we're back. Uh, we Yo. have music, and I hope that we have... Let me see if everything's working correctly. All my stuff, testing, testing. Okay, I okay. think I'm back. I do not have my my cameras not on right now. I'm, uh, no. The problem is when I turn it off. Let me just uh, try and uh, get it out of hibernation. Oh my gosh, they're seeing behind the scenes. No, no. Oh, oh gosh, this is, uh, <laughs> is it no longer it quality production. A, it's not a guys I guess in my live stream if I'm not spending half of it screwing with my setting. <laughs> 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 so guys, as soon as I figure out this black camera thing. Uh, actually, I can just turn on my webcam if I am possibly inclined. Okay, not as good. So this is my webcam, but you know, whatever. It'll do. It'll do. Um, so we are starting post-show Q&A. We have the Dago from the Russia Rework team here with us. I hope that my audio settings are right. I just want to... Good. So this is my webcam, but you know, whatever. It'll do. It'll do. Um, so we are starting... Po yes. Uh, let me know in the chat if there's anything... Uh, we, we're trying out a bunch of new OBS settings, so things are a little weird right now. First off, some bad news. Uh, I just saw a mistake in that video render that you saw uh, at the ending part where uh, you have a new run of the newspaper that says the like royal family murdered, but it should say Savinkov Critics uh, Silence Disappeared. So there's a, there's a mistake in editing. This means I need to re-upload. This means the video will not be able to be released on Sunday, probably Monday or Tuesday, whenever we can get the new upload in. So a few days delay, unfortunately. Uh, in a 40 minute video, you always have, you know, these minor things that you need to fix. So, uh, Dago, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. So I am part of the Russia Rework team. I mostly work in the, the writing portion, so a lot of localization, as well as a lot of the reworked lore. Um, the other sort of half of the dynamic duo, uh, Gideon's unfortunately can't join us. He's, uh, he's the, the Russian proper. Uh, I speak Russian, but I, I learned it. Um, so I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. We already have a whole bunch in the, in the Q&A, mm. which uh, I look forward to diving in and sort of <laughs> both answering your questions as well as teasing you with uh, whatever we can't answer directly. Okay. So uh, before we do, can you give us a, a general breakdown of what the reasoning is with Russia Rework, what you guys are focused on? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think the obvious answer is that reworking Russia in Kaiserreich is really digging down into the foundations of what makes Kaiserreich the mod that it is. Uh, since after all, Kaiserreich began as all of the Russias way back in the, uh, the mists of time, you know, circa 2005, 2006, uh, Hearts of Iron 2. Uh, so really a lot of the lore uh, that we're spicing up now, <laughs> if we want to put it that way, uh, is, is what built Kaiserreich as we know it and you know eventually it turned into this huge expansive universe which you have you know of course contributed so much to yourself uh, and of course that comes with it its own challenges of you know what is sacred that you can't touch or at least not change too much and what has to go the way of the dodo uh, mm -hmm. so sorry Kerensky you were you were a real one but we've packed you off to America now <laughs> there's a nice there's a nice sounding for Kerensky here and he goes to a farm upstate <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I like yeah. the university professor. 
Yeah. Mm. Uh, maybe the day before you do that. So the, I think the, the most common question I'm seeing here on live chat is uh, when is the Russia rework coming out? Of course. Ah, soon plus two weeks and right. two years and two decades. <laughs> uh, we can't, of course, provide a specific date like for any rework for Kaiser Reich, um, especially one of this magnitude. Uh, but a lot of work has been done for it and we're continuing to work on it. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled. We, we do plan on releasing more PRs uh, once the content is ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope that once it is ready for release that uh, you all will uh, go ahead and really like it. Okay. Uh, so let's go over the uh, Q&A that we're seeing here today. Go. Before I do, I should mention that uh, next week on Saturday we will be hosting a table read live stream for the Divided States. As you guys know, we are working on the world's first uh, show, episodic animatic show set in the Kaiser Reich universe. We are releasing the first episode on December 28th, I think the uh, exact time slot will be, and we are going to start recording. First we are inviting all our actors next week to introduce them to you guys and we'll be reading the script of the first episode, so make sure to mark your calendars, I'll make an announcement in the coming week as well. So, uh, Q&A channel on our Discord will have everything we need. I'm gonna start from the beginning. So Luke uh, from our patrons asks, how will the Charists take power from Savinkov's grip on Russia? Okay, uh, going right for the throat with the early questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, for this, and, and you'll actually see what I'm going to be talking about here up here in a couple of the later questions as well. Um, the main mechanism for a lot of the political action in Sabinkov's Russia is going to be through uh, what we call the anger system. And uh, you can see this teased in, I believe it was the, uh, the first PR uh, mm -hmm. that we made. Uh, and really it is the way that we track uh, Sabinkov's popularity and his ability to run Russia, uh, both among the Russian public, because he was elected after all. Uh, he didn't you know, take power in a coup. He was brought to power through democratic means. Uh, as well as his popularity among the army, uh, who, of course, after winning the Russian Civil War, the whites, even though they did uh, surrender some of their power uh, to democratic institutions, are still, in a way, kingmakers in Russia. And so you, if you push them too hard, then they might start causing trouble as well. And I, I can't go into too much detail, unfortunately, for the Tsar specifically, um, but they absolutely have a role in the system. And if you find yourself causing too much trouble with Sabinkov, then, you know, some people might start longing for the days of the Tsar back and, you know, yeah. watch yourselves after that one. Then you get, uh, obviously get into trouble. So the second question Luke asked was, uh, would it be possible for Kolchak to return from Arctic exploration if he's uh, called by the government? Uh, the, the other big man besides Kerensky, who, uh, who people like to, like to talk about. Uh, well, for Kolchak specifically, he doesn't necessarily ever leave um, because he is, at the end of the day, uh, Russia's Minister of the Navy. Um, so while he does love scampering off to the Arctic, uh, he will be a starting admiral for Russia. Uh -huh. uh, now, depending on what happens after sort of the beginning of 1936, though, you will see him get up to shenanigans both in the in the Arctic and without. Uh, so there, he will definitely have a role to play where you'll be sort of deciding uh, Col what Kolchak is up to. Okay. Um, but he isn't so far distant, you know, in the frozen north that he has just disappeared. Uh, he will be available from as an admiral from day one. Okay. So uh, a couple of questions from live chat the day ago. So can you restore the monarch monarchy? Oh, sorry. Uh, could you repeat that? You you cut out for a moment. Oh, at least uh, can, on my end. can you restore the monarchy? So is it possible to basically get a new char in power? Uh, yes, it is. So the Russia will, of course, have monarchist paths, as it does now. Um, one of the design principles that we set out when making the Russia rework is to not just full stop cut you know, a particular path. Like, no, this Russia is not allowed any longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there absolutely is um, a monarchist Russia that you can go down, and the, there may, in fact, be several flavors of it. Okay, okay. Uh, bunch of people asking like uh, about other episodes. Julian Muller asks, when will there be a Latin American episode? Uh, that's probably going to be at the tail end of the series, as we want to, <laughs> excuse me, as we want to focus on uh, major powers first, of course, always. Uh, Rear Admiral Bigcore asks, 
Uh, with Japan being mentioned, is Japanese lore coming soon? Uh, Japan was mentioned during Russia's episode, that's one that I can answer. Uh, we have no Japanese projects in active development. We will, of course, uh, talk about Japan in the broader context of the Asia episode. I'm not sure how comprehensive that will be. There will also be a World of Kaiserreich Japan, and maybe at the end of 2022. Again, uh, we have no concrete plans, but we do know that there's a storyline there with uh, Smiling Jack Malone that we want to continue as well. Of course, the we, Knights in Shanghai as well, yes, we will yes. mention uh, I, Japan in a smaller... And maybe uh, you can talk about Knights in Shanghai episode 2 for a minute, uh, Gabriel and Marcus, while we're uh, on the subject of Asia. Uh, that's Gabriel, Gabriel, director of everything East Asia, please. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, at least some of you guys have probably seen the first episode that we released uh, a while ago. I don't remember precisely when. One year, um, that... uh, exactly one year, yeah. Oh, there we go. About a year ago. Uh, and originally we had intended that to be part of a series where we would sort of go around to different locations around the Kaiserreich setting and sort of explore different little stories. Well, it didn't end up being that. It ended up being uh, a, a, an actual series focused specifically on the character there, Frank Duncan, and his various shenanigans yeah. in, in Shanghai and in the location cities. So we have another episode of that coming up in the future. Yep. Uh, I don't know precisely when. Um, so Emily Serdal, who you guys will see during the uh, uh, La Actor uh, table read next week, is currently shooting a live action in North America. <laughs> oh, I think it's Boston. I forgot the city. You know, you guys have too many like big cities. You should try the Belgian way. We have like one city. We have Brussels, and then the rest is <laughs> the countryside. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so she's up in Boston, I think, or Chicago, or whatever, uh, shooting live action. She will be back in December, which means she can record. I'm not sure about Walter Lutch, who is playing Duncan. I have have contacted him, have not gotten an email yet. I can rustle him if you want. Uh, I'm thinking January, February release, something like that. Yeah. There's uh, obviously a bunch of moving parts there. Uh, <laughs> the illustrator should be available starting in December. I've asked Albert Buschio, who is also uh, one of our assisting illustrators on The Divided States, to join us for that project as well. We'll uh, tell you guys more. But to uh, pivot back onto Russia. E -do 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 -do. Yeah, sure thing. And actually, just as a, as a preface for the live chat, I just want to give a shout out to the to the Russian fans. Вы, конечно, можете написать вопросы по-русски, но, к сожалению, все ответы будут по-английски. Это, в конце концов, английский стрим. So there I'm just telling people, feel free to write in Russian if you'd like. Um, Gid might be joining us, I hope, later, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> but I can read the, Rush the questions in Russian if they're asking it and, uh, and respond. Right, cool. Um, so Jack Old Didego also asks, uh, so what is Ragnall doing? So what is Ragnall's lore, uh, sorry, role in the new lore? Is that the crazy... Um... Mongolian? Who's Wrangle again? Uh, Wrangle uh, used Wrangle... to be a bad outpath. Ah, oh yeah. Yeah, back in the in the misty days of uh, the distant past. Yeah, he is perhaps better known as the Black Baron. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's definitely going to be present in the rework. Uh, we've already teased him a little bit in bits and pieces here, uh, but he's definitely going to play an important role. Uh, he was, after all, one of the most important white commanders, and that has has sort of played its way forward uh, into where we find ourselves in 1936. Uh, so he's definitely going to have a role uh, not only in the military uh, as a general, he's going to have a role um, in various events, decisions, as well as how you develop your army. So you'll definitely be seeing a lot of him. Okay. Um, so Dull Dice asks on Discord, how has uh, No Step Back influenced the process and decision making of the Russia rework, if at all? Oh, <laughs> it, it has influenced it a great deal. Um, positively and negatively is, is how I could put it. Um, in terms of decision making, once we saw how much content was coming in No Step Back, uh, and as, as well as the focus that it would be having, uh, because it, it began production you know, way back in the past when we were also sort of figuring out how Russia was going to go about. Mm -hmm. uh, but we almost immediately decided that there was no way we could release Russia before No Step Back um, is released just because if we did, then No Step Back would roll up, you know, a month or two later and just annihilate <laughs> what we'd done beforehand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we established very early on that anything we're going to release for Russia is going to come after No Step Back. And in terms of its specific systems, I mean, I'm personally excited for a whole lot, but 
it's going to take, a, I think, a little while to really get to grips with how it changes uh, Hoi 4 in its entirety, uh, let alone Kaiserreich. But mm -hmm. I'm excited to take advantage of some of the new things that it'll be introducing, for sure. Okay. Thanks, Paradox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it looks like a looks like a, like an interesting update. I, the Hearts of Iron player base is at an all time high. Do you guys have you guys heard that news? I it's, did. Yeah. Yeah, it's been in, it's been in the it's been uh, on the paradox. So Hearts of Iron is proving to be a really popular game, which puts me in an awkward position because you guys know I'm famous. I do not actually like Hearts of Iron four as a game. <laughs> I've always been a Darkest Tower player. Always. Uh, I enjoy the. Um, sort of the um, i'm trying to find the uh, the tac tactility and um, that's not a word in english it is in my language um basically of individually moving units and just the way darkest hour feels like you're playing on this sort of old computing machine where you have to press plus to zoom in and it says like chunk chunk every time you zoom in i miss <laughs> that and i hope if we ever see like a horse of iron 5 we get a bit of that horse of iron 4 to me feels very digital e we get a return to that analog feeling that sort of darkest hour had um, but yeah, just uh, an interesting little tidbit. So we have a few more questions here. Uh, I've got some questions here from the, the Kaiserreich Discord, which mm -hmm. should be on our Discord. But um, does Kaiser Cat's new Russia video differ in any way from the reworks lore? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a good, uh, good question, Dago. Oh, for, sure, I, I can take a stab at that. Um, I mean, of course, we were consulting one to the other um, through yeah. a lot of the production for the documentary. Um, though, of course, some changes were made um, even within our, on our, our own end for the lore. Uh, some things obviously had to be adjusted on the other end, too. Uh, I would say that if I could point to one thing, it would probably be the timeline for Kerensky's departure. And admittedly, it's, it's not a big thing because in the, with the way it's been phrased already in the documentary, uh, it can very easily be applied that Kretzky did leave in uh, in sort of 1917 as he as he would in the way that we're establishing it on our end in the lore, uh, because Kerensky's escape from Russia is going to be pretty similar to how it happened uh, sort of in our own history, where he ducked out after the Winter Palace was stormed, briefly considered trying to fight back, and then decided, nah, I'm sick of it. <laughs> you guys figure it out on your own, and then left Russia, never returned, and you know, lived out the rest of his days being a professor. <laughs> Which might be slightly complicated in terms of how the timeline plays out in uh, in Kaiserreich. You know, New York is a, a little a little bit different. Yeah, of course. All right. Uh, going further down that list, let me pull it back up. So, how many SRs? Jix Prime asks. So, how, how many social revolutionaries do we still have in a Dubai nineteen thirty six? Ooh, uh, good question. I mean, in terms of specific delegate numbers, I'm not sure if we have that available to hand. I'm sure Gid probably has a knocking around somewhere in one of his documents because he loves getting into the really nitty gritty of uh, you know how many particular parliamentarians are there at any one time. Uh, but I would say in 1936 that the SRs, while they've definitely been weakened um, in the course of the you know past couple of years events, the war in Manchuria, uh, the Tambov Rebellion, uh, that would be in 1932, by the way. Mm. Uh, they are certainly worse for wear, uh, but they're still boasting enough numbers to be a threat. And that's kind of the position which you sort of end the, doc the documentary on as well, with Chernov trying to rally uh, sort of the, the remnants of democracy to try to oppose Savinkov. And, you know, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Okay. Uh, some questions, basically more about the country surrounding Russia. So Georgia and Boulderev. So how does Georgia... How does Georgia appear during the Civil War specifically, and how does it impact Russia during the game? Oh, people people tempting me with Caucasus questions. That's dangerous. I did I did a lot of reading on the Caucasus, uh, just as sort of a particular area of focus mm -hmm. uh, going into this rework. Uh, for Georgia specifically, uh, they arrive under pretty similar circumstances during the course of the uh, sort of end of the Weltkrieg going into the Civil War, uh, as they did in our own history. Uh, but really where things begin to change is in the relationship that they have with Germany, uh, because of course Georgia is actually sort of a, almost a flashpoint between uh, the Germans and the Ottoman Empire in terms of how they're dividing their spheres of influence in sort of the post-Russian Caucasus. Okay. And Georgia, of course, uh, survives because uh, an agreement is reached between the whites and Germany, so of course they are not going to be allowed to go uh, knocking next door into what's a very important German puppet at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so Georgia remains, and perhaps most controversially and most dangerously for Russia, uh, it becomes a very 
important staging ground for the sorts of people that Russia would like to get rid of, uh, but perhaps doesn't have the easiest time doing so. Yeah, <laughs> so okay. Boulder F is actually uh, just one of several different people uh, who have been causing trouble for Russia in the region, but he is going to be a quite dangerous one, as you'll find out uh, over the course of the game. Uh, but actually, one of the events that we teased in the second PR, uh, which shows the unification of the exiled Mountain Republic with the forces of Boldirev, is a reference to what has been happening in kind of 1920s Georgia with uh, insurgents and guerrillas crossing the very rugged border between Georgia and Russia, uh, fighting in the North Caucasus in this sort of never-ending low-intensity conflict in the area. Yeah, oh, okay, interesting. Um, so, going forward, uh, so some people ask if this uh, stream will be recorded on YouTube. It is being recorded on YouTube, so no worries. You can always uh, just get just check back in here uh, later. Um, as I mentioned before, the documentary will probably be delayed by a few days, the final release, because we're seeing one or two issues here that we want to fix and re-upload. Um, Max so Montanas. Uh, says something on the on the YouTube. He says, "How did foreign interventions in Russia take place during the Civil War, and how did it affect oh, yeah. the current political situation?" That's an interesting. Because I, I I remember that we actually used some uh, Canadian expeditionary uh, uh, pictures of them in Russia. I'm not, and I was I don't actually remember how that actually affected um, today ago, like foreign interventions in Russia. Yeah, I'd be glad to answer that one as well. Uh, so it's definitely uh, just a tiny bit different from how things played out in the, in the real world. And a lot of that comes from just the different circumstances during the Weltkrieg, uh, with, for one, of course, the United States not entering the war. And mm. the Americans played a very prominent role, uh, both in northern Russia, around uh, Murmansk and Arhangelsk, as well as in the east around Vladivostok. Uh, so with them not showing up, that's a very important interventionist power, especially a counterweight against the Japanese that is not present in Kaiserreich. Uh, and the other big one, uh, which is very important in terms of how the Whites ended up uh, establishing a, a relationship with Germany in, in the Kaiserreich timeline, is the fact that since the Bosporus, uh, the Ottoman Empire, you know, it, it never falls, it's never opened to Allied shipping, uh, there is never the very prominent presence of Entente troops in southern Russia, in southern Ukraine. Uh, which in a lot of cases kept the whites alive in that area uh, for much longer than they alone would have been able to sustain themselves. And it's really Germany uh, and Ukraine who in this vacuum step in to play that role. And it's it's a tug of war sort of between the, the white Russians, very natural kind of repulsion at being forced to work with the Germans uh, with the very practical necessity of all of our friends are very far away and they have bigger problems on their own plate. So maybe helping out the Germans is the lesser of two evils if the other option is is annihilation at the hands of the Bolsheviks. That's a that's a good answer. Good 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 job. Can you uh, <laughs> read the next question mark? Because I'm just answering some stuff in text uh, right now. Mm. Uh, uh, ba, 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 uh, questions. Um, I'm, do I look for questions now? Uh, let's see. Uh, how would you compare the, the level of industrialization between uh, Kaiserreich timeline Russia and uh, our timeline Soviet Union? Actually, I remember I saw in the documents you guys had a whole document yeah, about just been, industrialization. That yeah, was a it's really well described. That that we did, yeah. And I I oh, think the crazy. figure that Gid ended up settling on, just to kind of have an easy shorthand, is about two thirds of um of what you could expect from the historical Soviet Union relative to how Russia is in Kaiserreich. Uh, so it isn't a complete backwater, but at the same time, it hasn't uh, developed quite to the same uh, degree that it did uh, in our own timeline. Uh, probably the, one of the big, easiest comparisons you can make is that the, uh, the five-year plan uh, that Stalin initiated in our timeline would have happened uh, before 1936, which is when Kaiserreich, of course, uh, begins. And so you as a player in Savinkov's shoes are going to be sort of catching up uh, in that arena of industrialization. And we, of course, don't want to make too many Stalin comparisons, but one thing we, we sort of settled He's upon... He's a very big for, character, yeah. He is a very big character, but one of the things we sort of realized during development is that for, for Russia to be able to industrialize in a, a kind of plausible manner, they would have to really go um, sort of balls to the wall, if I can use that phrase, very quickly. Uh, come 1936 to be able to compete with a power like Germany. 
And from that sort of starting point, uh, we developed a very interesting system, which uh, which we teased, and I want to say it was the second uh, PR, with the uh, the Vashod program yeah. uh, that Savinkov can initiate. That's that's well, two thirds. That's 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 about what I got out of that. But you guys really thought about this. I'm, yeah. and maybe in the end, you know, we we when we when everything is released, you get all the the documents together and you you know mash into a nice nice little booklet, you know. <laughs> we it's have really... plenty of wiki, you... wiki fodder. I will say that. Would you say... I have a question then. I have a question myself. What wh what do you have on there? Like a fun trivia that that is not like sort of shown in the game or somehow. Like what do you have that you want to tell people about? It's like, but it's, but it's hard for them to find out about. You know. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think the one that has stuck out for me the most is being able to give Savinkov and his party, uh, whether you want to call it the Motherland Party, the, the, the Svabodniki, uh, more of a clearly understandable ideology and a clearly understandable flavor. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think one of the big issues so far um, with the Russia that, you know, as it exists currently, is that you don't really get a clear idea of what it is exactly that Savinkov believes in, uh, what mm -hmm. is national populism. <laughs> uh, and. I think one of the, one of the challenges that we've had to tackle uh, with the rework now is being able to to answer that question, to deliver an interesting and plausible uh, new, powerful, you know, autocratic totalitarian nation uh, that doesn't just feel like this kind of cobbling together of, of random ideas without much explanation. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing questionnaire. So, will you be able to reform the Soviet Union? <laughs> Uh, reform? No, because the Soviet Union never, never appeared in the first uh, place. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> they probably mean like a syndicalist, you know, USSR equivalent, basically. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, there will be a uh, socialist Russia path, so don't worry. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, from the very outset, we decided we're not going to be cutting uh, any path outright, because I think that would be a disservice to the legacy that Russia has in the mod, and it would be a disservice to the, the kind of player choice and player agency that we value. So yes, there will be uh, socialist Russia options. Not as uh, USSR necessarily, but you know, keep your eyes peeled. The uh, I mean, the mod started with Russia essentially, right? So when Sarmatia made the first mod, it was 100% centered on Russia. It was called All the Russias. That's why we called this episode All the Russias as well. Uh, yeah, like we I said, have, a very deep legacy there. Yeah. We have a video on our channel, which is a Q&A with Sarmatia, where if you're interested in that, to anyone who's watching, uh, just look up Sarmatia interview, Kazakat Cinema, you'll find it. It's basically, I talked to Sarmatia about, you know, his ideas when originally starting Kaiserreich. And uh, I hope to speak to him again in the future. Very interesting guy. Uh, all right. So going further down in that question list. What happened to the Czechoslovak Legion? Oh, yeah. We haven't mentioned them at all. We, we uh. had them in the original script. But then we were like, this is not actually relevant at all to, to, to Russia. Yeah, I actually like this question because I, I find that in the uh, the Ask a Dev portion of the uh, the main Kaiser Egg Discord, uh, this is actually one of the more common ones that pops up um, mm. when people ask about Russia. So I, I think I actually made a, a copy pasta to answer it. So I'll try my best to, to sort of paraphrase from memory. Uh, so of course, for people who don't know, the Czechoslovak Legion was, was very important um, in the events of the Russian Civil War, both in our own history as well as in Kaiser Reich, uh, because they were effectively one of the main catalysts that allowed the white movement to rise up against the Bolsheviks. Uh, they were a collection of Czech and Slovak, imagine that, uh, former prisoners of war who had joined the Russian army. And when Russia basically pulled out of the war, the Entente decided, hey, let's take these Czechs and Slovaks and <laughs> shuffle them from Ukraine to, you know, basically Manchuria in, and then Vladivostok and then ship them to France, basically a journey around the world. And of course, it didn't quite go to plan. They started fighting the Bolsheviks. And from there, they became a very important fighting force within the white movement. Uh, now, where they stand in Kaiserreich, I would say that um, by 1936, they're definitely a bit more of a historical legacy than a active political or military force. I mean, a lot of them uh, at this point, would probably be in their 40s or their 50s, so they, they've probably retired from the military. Uh, some of them would have remained in Russia. Others probably would have filtered, uh, you know, into emigration. Um, but we definitely have not forgotten about them. I'm personally looking forward to, to writing a, a flavor event or two that will involve the Czechoslo Czechoslovak Legion, just to sort of, you know, say a thank you. We haven't forgotten about you, I promise. Uh, but in terms of gameplay, um, 
really, at this point, they're just a little bit too old, and they don't really have the numbers that they once had uh, to be a kind of tangible gameplay element by uh, by 1936. Thank you for that. Uh, I should mention that the winner of the prize question is uh, Sylvia Montaez. So Sylvia Montaez was the first one to uh, email me correctly. With the correct answer, so congratulations, Sylvia. I will uh, send you an email. Uh, make sure to send me your order details, and we'll we'll get in touch to get you that hoodie. Congrats. Going back further down the uh, the question list, I think we're uh, reaching the end of it, which is good. I had about uh, twelve more minutes planned in this stream. Uh, so Jesse uh, from our patron crew asks, is it possible to have an anarchist Russia? Ah, getting really into specifics here. Um, I'm under very strict standing orders not to tease too much, especially about um, about socialist Russia. So I'm afraid I have to say, watch this space. <laughs> I, I promise we'll talk about it eventually. Good answer. Yeah, he's held a gunpoint. He can't say more, you know? I exactly. I don't want to be liquidated. It's, uh, <laughs> there's there's always uh, Savinkov's, uh, Savinkov's guys watching. Um, Max Montana on the live chat asks, Will a democratic or monarchic uh, Russia be able to join the Entente? Ooh, the Entente question. That was one that has been debated and debated many a time uh, within the Russia we work and uh, really just within the broader Kaiserreich team as a whole because that happening is, is such a huge shift in kind of the balance of power in the world and the answer that we kind of settled on is that R russia being in any of the major factions uh, outside of the moscow accord is such an enormous shift in balance that for the sake of just trying to keep balance and consistency they will remain kind of a force unto their own mm -hmm. uh, no matter which of the pads you ultimately take now of course they will trend uh, toward one faction or another, depending on which path you go. Uh, but in terms of outright joining the Entente, uh, that we we have not decided to implement. Okay. So, short answer, uh, not at this time. There's a few <laughs> questions that I have about miners uh, in the Caucasus. For example, Theodore, uh, I know Dodago, the Caucasus is your specialty. So he asks, you know, uh, what about Azerbaijan? Because we have Azerbaijan. Uh, between several countries that we have that have known reworks like Iran, uh, like Russia, like Armenia, uh, but it's not being talked about. Oh, I wish I could talk more about Azerbaijan. Um, <laughs> admittedly, I'm not on the Azerbaijan team as of yet, uh, but it is definitely not forgotten. I can say okay. that. Um, Keep a close eye on the Iran rework is what I'll say for that. Okay, so Azerbaijan will be in the wider context of the Iran rework. Yes, so in terms of, okay. um, you, you, I don't think you'll be able to expect any Azerbaijan content uh, directly with the Russia rework, but mm -hmm. it definitely has not been forgotten. Um, so they will get uh, some love and attention in the future. Okay, so there's an answer, uh, Theodore 1C. Uh, there's a few questions about Transamur. I know we've touched on Transamur, but can we repeat that for the people who maybe didn't hear it the first time? So what is the status of Transamur post-Russia rework? Sure thing. So th this has been a, a point of confusion at times in that Transamur is not going to be uh, on the map in 1936 at Game Start, okay. uh, but it is by by no means removed from the game. Transamur is actually going to be uh, substantially more important in the rework than it is now, uh, and you can expect a lot of exciting uh, paths and gameplay. I think it's Nya who's the main dev for um, for Transamur, uh, and the, th the stuff that he's shown me looks fantastic. I really look forward to seeing it develop, and I think the fans will really appreciate uh, the love and care that will be put into Transamur uh, come the rework. Okay, well, looking forward to that. So um, people can, of course, refer to this Q&A later if they want to have a few more, uh, some more information about the Russia rework. Uh, scrolling up on the live chat, we're going to start collecting our final questions for today, guys. Uh, Homero Garza Jr. is here, of course. Uh, well, Homero, uh, he's always with us for the premiere, so welcome. Uh, don't see a question on him. He was just uh, saying that he loved the episode. Uh... We love the episode too, you know. This we we don't not like anything we make here. What? Right? That's that's the right answer. 
<laughs> no, we, we are, hate uh, working at Kaiserreich. Yeah, we are uh, we are creative, so we perpetually hate everything we make and ourselves. <laughs> oh, does that sound? Uh, now, now that is a strong mood. Uh, we're I never was, happy. With what I we've was done. I was going over the shot list for the divided states. Um, and was like, oh man, we spent so much time on this show, so much time on the show. And I was like, why are very hard things so difficult? You know? I wonder about that. Why, why is it so hard to do hard things? <laughs> it's always the fun reward though, because at the end of the day, you have like, what are you doing all day? It's like, I made this. And you can show them like, oh, that's nice art. You yeah. know? Uh, Here's I'm some music. Some questions on Donkuban. Uh, so what is the... So the Donkuban Union does not seem to be on the map post-Russia rework, what is their status? So is there any you know, legacy path still in Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia? Uh, are they just 100% gone? Okay, so it's a similar scenario uh, in terms of Transamore. And I, yeah. I see I can answer a couple of questions here, both for Asar and Tehroser. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can just re reply to him in Polish for a second there. Uh, but Don Koban Union, yes, that's an exciting one because it is sort of being split off in a couple of different directions. Uh, so, of course, as a gameplay element of this kind of enemy to your south, that is going to be Boulderev now. Um, but in terms of the Cossacks themselves, mm -hmm. they have kind of been uh, divided into how they will play uh, in the coming rework. So... At game start, uh, the Southeast Union that Terrozer mentions in his comment, it doesn't really exist. I mean, it, it's debatable whether it ever existed, but this is going to get into really obscure Russian history, so I'll try not to dwell on that. Okay. But basically, the Cossacks in the South have come to an arrangement uh, with Savinkov to a larger degree, um, with, I, I guess, a kind of modus vivandi, if I can pop the yeah, Latin there, okay, cool. uh, where... Yeah. Because they are very, very powerful landowners. During the era of the Russian Empire, uh, they were kind of an elite military force that was expected to, rather than pay taxes, to serve in the military. And Savinkov, he always had this kind of ideological appreciation um, for this kind of mythical Cossack spirit. Uh, and of course, the Cossacks were an incredibly important element of the white forces during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are, a, in, a, in a sense, a kind of natural ally to Savinkov. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, they are first, like first and foremost, looking after themselves. So, if circumstances change in Russia, then they may very well decide that they can get a better deal elsewhere. Okay. And so, the the situation that the Caucasus finds itself in, the kind of former Don Kuban Union area, is that you have many, many, like, literally dozens of different ethnic groups who are all competing for influence. Some of them are backed by the government. Some of them are backed by foreign powers, and you're kind of caught in this tug of war of who's going to end up on which side and that will have an effect on how the gameplay ultimately develops. Okay. Um, so speaking about Russian foreign policy and things like the Donkoban Union, uh, there's a few interesting questions here that shift the focus a little bit more westward. So uh, Julian Muller Spinelli asks, can Russia uh, have a more direct intervention in things like the Danubian or Bulgarian wars? Hmm. So For like a that? more uh, pan-Slavic, uh, like pan-Slavic Balkan thing. Ah, good question. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of anything for the moment. Um, but admittedly, a lot of the kind of more nuanced foreign policy um, choices have not fully been uh, decided yet. Mostly because it touches on on a variety of other reworks that so themselves are kind of figuring out uh, how they are going to sort of design their gameplay. Um, so we're kind of keeping that on the back burner. I would personally love to see more of that kind of involvement, mm -hmm. uh, but really at this point it's TBD. Okay. I'm going to bring us into final questions. Uh, ah, Homero did ask a couple of questions. Ravazul asked about, what about the women battalions? Because I remember we used a few of their footage as well, actually, the women's battalions. Yeah, sure. They were actually one of the few footage that were in, like, HD. For the, for the documentary. Yeah, that was really, really quality footage. And uh, I can actually speak a little bit on the women's battalions because uh, they have not been forgotten either. Uh, one th one element of Savinkov's ideology that we've uh, really decided to, to kind of play up to give him more character uh, is this idolization of the, um, of the death battalions um, from the era of the Civil War and to an extent the later uh, portions of the Weltkrieg. Uh, because while the women's battalion of death is 
by far and away the most well-known one, I think for kind of obvious reasons, it's really out there. Uh, but the Russian army at that time had really kind of decided that we have to focus ourselves on the most motivated, the most patriotic, uh, the most willing to self-sacrifice for the cause of Russia. Mm -hmm. And that kind of spirit uh, is channeled into the Motherland Party among the Svobodniki. Uh, and you'll see that really um, kind of emphasized in Savinkov's propaganda. Uh, this is how they portray themselves. If you want a comparison, uh, probably the um, the Arditi in Italy is a really good one. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, to kind of capture that almost obsession with nationalist martyrdom. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, we have a few questions by uh, Sir John Jack Reed. What role does Central Asia, we haven't spoken about Central Asia, I think, have in the lore and during the Russian Civil War, given the situation of the time? Uh, Central Asia, yeah, that's that's also a really interesting one, because we kind of <laughs> almost shoved the rework forward a bit mm. uh, in uh, in the current release version, because of course you'll see that, um, that Al-Ash and uh, Turkestan have kind of changed around a little bit. Mm. And that's really in preparation for um, for what's ultimately going to be uh, worked on in more detail come the come the Russia rework. Uh, so it, it, it definitely has also not been a forgotten region. We want to, to give it more flavor and more agency than just being uh, a kind of speed bump for Russia as it kind of expands and grows into a force capable of fighting Germany. We want these smaller, uh, once forgotten areas to be able to, to make their presence felt. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've already teased it a little bit uh, with the various crises. So you'll definitely, for example, have to deal with uh, with rebellion in, uh, in Kazakhstan, as well as potentially other areas, uh, which you'll have to deal with. And there's going to be a lot of events and, uh, and some decisions, I think some national foci as well, that will cover uh, how Russia approaches this area and as well how the uh, how the locals respond to that. Because of course we don't want it to be a, just a one-sided relationship where one side is expected to kind of roll over and die yeah, <laughs> for okay. the benefit of the other. Mm. All right, so um, I say one last question, uh, Marcus if, or Diego, if you want to pick one. Oh, that's that's a good one. All right, um, Diego, it, all on you, man. Yeah, let me <laughs> let me scan what uh, what's been popping up so far. Then, uh, hang on. Ah, here's maybe a good one. Uh, will the Russian state provide support for a faction of their choosing during the Second American Civil War? It is something I've been thinking about, and that's Romero Garcia Jr. Uh, that's a good one because I because of course you guys do a whole lot of stuff for the American Civil War, and I know it's a big point of interest for a lot of people. And uh, it's definitely something that we've been thinking about uh, in the Russia rework. Again, foreign policy is always a bit of a, a sticky question because it is always touching, you know, sort of stepping on the toes of other devs and we have to, you know, clear things first with them. Uh, but in terms of how we're going to be approaching the the American Civil, or the Second American Civil War, uh, it'll be interesting because Russia, in the condition that it finds itself in kind of 1936, 1937, is, is not necessarily much better off. Uh, so there's definitely going to be a trade-off in the sense of are you willing uh, to kind of go overseas to sort out other people's problems and there's a great deal of issues at home already uh, that you might have to deal with. Now if you if you want to ask my personal headcanon completely unofficially, I see uh, Sevenkov supporting MacArthur. I think that there's a, <laughs> there's perhaps some parallels to be drawn one from the other and of course uh, with the AUS and long perhaps, I mean, typically being supported by Germany. Uh, Savinkov isn't really in the business of <laughs> helping anyone possibly align with the Germans. And so, uh, yeah, maybe you'll, you'll one day find Cossacks roaming the, uh, the Great Plains. <laughs> uh, that's an image to draw. That's pretty good. So, um, <laughs> so I cannot speak, of course, to uh, Kaiserreich lore itself. Now, the divided states uh, specifically exists on its own timeline path with different options. Um, the Russians will make an appearance, so the, it will be a Russian state resurgent uh, path in the case of the divided states, which begins in 1940. Um, so we will see Savinkov in power. We will see them play a role in the show as well, mostly in the sense that they... Um, without spoiling too much of the story, uh, that they have a vested interest in some of the things happening and some of the uh, items that may be carried by some of our outcasts. Uh, and they will send a party after, uh, they will basically set up some kind of trade, though we have not written out what their allegiance to what American faction they are. Uh, they have an allegiance to specifically 
in the end, they do appear as, uh, as like a one or two episode villains when they chase the party, when the deal goes wrong. And uh, so I don't think it's that they don't specifically support one faction. It's more of a, a proxy deal, I would say, right? So they're not there in an official political sense. But of course, yeah. that is uh, Divided States. Divided States exists on its own timeline, which is based off the world of Kaiserreich, but does not uh, decide Kaiserreich canon. I think these documentaries are intended to be like the Kaiserreich canon, as they talk about the Kaiserreich timeline up until 1936, at which point you have you know that opening of the timeline, the fan, uh, what we like to refer to uh, jokingly as the Kaiserreich cinematic universe or the, uh, the Kaiserverse. All right, so uh, I'd say that is all the questions for us today. Uh, you guys want to add some, anything to this live stream before we close it off for today? I don't know. I would just like to thank everyone for coming out and, of course, thanking the team, you guys, for putting this together. It's a, a fantastic documentary. And uh, I mean, just I'm, I'm still marveling at just the length of it and the amount it's, of effort that you guys have put in. It's uh, quite so long. Round, round of applause <laughs> for you. And I hope uh, people are applauding in the audience as well. And then to know and, uh, that we've got like Eastern Europe we, from it, and cut then so much from yeah, it. Yeah, we've got so much that we need to now put in. I think it's going to be more than eight episodes to cover because next episode we will need to cover Eastern Europe uh, in in the context of Germany as well. We have that written, just not in this episode. Um, so there's definitely a couple of things that we need to get to. Uh, I'm not concerned about. Uh, we'll have plenty of plenty of work. Uh, detailing all this lore and uh, I don't think we'll be shy of lore anytime soon <laughs> alright uh, so yeah Dago uh, it was really great working with you guys I hope to see you again uh, when we do more things with Russia maybe in the context of the divided states maybe in the context of Knights in Shanghai which also has you know Russia as a player uh, is situated in Asia as a completely different more inter interesting scenario um, maybe in the context of other shorts as you guys know we're always working on animatics shorts original series set in the world of Kaiserreich. Uh some final notes that I should give uh, Patrick Warner who is the uh, the narrator for this episode is appearing in the Amazon Prime show Masters of the Air. I'm not sure exactly when it is going live, but he is uh, in that show, so make sure to watch that. I'm gonna ask everyone uh, also next week to tell me what projects they are working on. Marcus, you have anything that's uh, premiering that we should tell the community about? Um, I have a World War One, uh, World War Two short film coming out hopefully in February of 2022. Um, while not based in the Kaiserreich, was really heavily influenced by, I suppose, the world of Kaiserreich and everything here. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's about a German soldier stuck in a landmine. German soldier stuck in a landmine, a Marcus Jorgensen uh, currently untitled short film, I think, because you've never actually told me a title. Uh, untitled, yep. <laughs> Currently untitled Marcus Jorgensen project uh, releasing in February 2022. Masters yeah. of the Air uh, for Patrick Warner releasing, I'm not sure when. I should have looked this up before the live stream, but uh, it's been quite hectic here. The Divided States episode one releasing December 28th. Next week we will have a live stream with all the actors. We're doing a table read. Marcus is going to be there because both me and Ar uh, Marcus have roles in the show. Uh, we die horribly in the first scene that we appear in, so nothing that I think will launch our acting careers, but, you know, <laughs> just filling in some gaps. Um, thanks to everyone for helping us. I forgot to mention Rusky Business, who did all the cool map work that you've seen in the, uh, in the show. Uh, you can, of course, always support us by, let me just make my regular run so I make sure that, uh, by visiting the amazing KaiserCatCinema.com, which is a merchandise a web shop which has everything uh i set that up all the arts uh, that we make i've put on here you can see my posters the ones you see behind me as well uh if you look down my room you'll see i filled the walls with them uh they're really cool posters if you want to support us you can always send us a single donation send us something on patreon uh you know where to find us we're pretty much everywhere uh yeah, the check flags, out new yeah. flags Sticker. The flags have been renewed. We now have an improved flag stock. Uh, I can show you guys that, I think, right before we sign off. Uh, just give me a minute. Let me pull up the old uh, new flag stock. So here's the old one, I think. And 
then I'll show you. Okay. Want to make sure that. Uh... So uh, the difference between the old and the new flag stocks, I think, will show on screen. Uh, if you hang it against the wall, it's not too much. You won't see too much of a difference. Yeah, with the light on this end, it's actually not. You can see me through, right? You can see me uh, through this thing slightly. But the new ones basically have a thicker fabric. So here's a new flag. And this is the Austria Hungarian one that we also saw. Uh, they're all three by five feet. They're still single sided. You can see thicker fabric. It's uh, You cannot see me through it. Uh, also fixed a few minor things, you know, about uh, grommeting. Uh, unfortunately, still single sided. A lot of people ask about double sided prints. These are intended as wall flags. I was thinking of hanging this one up, uh, up against the wall. Uh, we do not have plans for that right now, but I'm discussing with some suppliers if it will be possible and uh, I'll keep you guys posted, but it's not looking like something that we can do in 2021. Maybe not even 2022. All right, that's all that I have for you guys. Thank you all for your continued support to Guys Get Cinema. Next week, we will live stream again because we will be visiting, uh, seeing all the actors from the divided states and we will table read the entire episode. So join us for the first ever live rendition of an original show set in the Kaiserreich universe. And now I'm going to spend an awkward uh, 15 seconds trying to find the outro to this live stream, which is on OBS. And it's not a Kaiser Cat Cinema live stream if I'm... Oh, here we go, here we go. All right, I got it. Thank you all, and until Bye -bye. the next one. Bye, guys. Kaiser Cat Cinema needs you. Back the attack. Share our content. Or dash over to our Horse History webshop. Oh, 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 God. No, no, okay, uh... I think they can hear us over, uh, over this thing. <laughs> I'm just gonna end stream. Oh yeah, we're out of here. Ah, we're out. We're out.